All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Jacqueline Carville, and I will be both moderating and presenting the webinar today. We're going to be keeping today's talk short and sweet, uh, ending around 30 minutes. Uh, so before we begin, let me just go over how this webinar is going to work. You may have noticed that your phone has been muted. However, I do encourage you to ask questions along the way. Just type your question into the chat dialog at the right side of your screen and select Send to Host. I'll be taking questions at the end of the talk today. I will also be posting the video recording of this webinar either later this afternoon or tomorrow morning, so take a look out for an email from me with a link to this recording if you have to leave mid-webinar. To introduce myself, I am the Marketing Director here at ICT. I work very closely with our R&D team to put together our webinars program, uh, write our helpful blog posts, and keep new products launching on our website. As we move forward, in addition to your questions on today's presentation, if you do have any ideas or requests for future webinar topics that you'd like to see, feel free to chat those in during the presentation today. Today's talk will be focused on pyroptosis, looking at its unique mechanisms of cell death, as well as fluorescent methods of detecting caspase-1 activity in whole cells. To give a bit of background on immunochemistry technologies, we are located in Bloomington, Minnesota, which is a suburb just south of Minneapolis. ICT just celebrated its 22nd anniversary in September, so we have been in the immunoassay business for quite some time. So here at ICT, we do offer both service projects as well as our different product lines. And I'll provide some more detail on these offerings, but I did want to make a note that all of our products and services are for research use only and not for use in diagnostic procedures. So when ICT was founded, we originally began as a services company. Our scientists have years of experience with protein chemistry and ELISA optimization, so we can help you develop reliable, sensitive, and specific immunoassays. We can also scale up and manufacture an assay for internal use for clients. If you're in need of a service project, feel free to reach out and get in touch, and I'm more than happy to facilitate a discussion with our R&D scientists to discuss the scope of your project. Now, one product line that I wanted to briefly touch on here is our ELISA solutions. Now, these include all of the components that you need to build a better ELISA. The coding buffers, blockers, sample and assay diluents, conjugate stabilizers, and wash buffer all work together to minimize the buildup of unwanted proteins to generate a very clean signal. These products work together to address common issues you might encounter during ELISA development, such as specificity, sensitivity, reproducibility, and shelf life. Our ultimate goal here is to help you develop optimized ELISAs that have a high specific signal and low background noise. And that's all I'll mention about our ELISA products today, but if you do have questions about this product line, feel free to chat them in, and I can make sure to get you a response after the webinar. Now the product line that we'll focus on for today's presentation is our cell viability assay kits. Our cell viability assays include a large range of fluorescent whole cell assays for intracellular apoptosis detection and cellular analysis. ICT's line of assay kits can detect apoptosis, uh, necrosis, intracellular caspase activity, cell-mediated cytotoxicity, activated serine proteases, oxidative stress, mitochondrial membrane permeability, and so much more. Now these kits are designed for use in whole living cells, so no lysing of the cells is required in this work. Now some of you might be longtime ICT product users or have heard of our popular Flicka product line for caspase detection, but we do offer so much more in a wide range of fluorescent applications. So today, First, we're going to be discussing pyroptosis and how it compares to other known cellular death processes. Next, we'll be discussing some of the mechanisms of pyroptosis and the key players in pyroptosis pathways. 
We'll also discuss some disease implications associated with pyroptosis and caspase-1 activity. And finally, we'll launch into a discussion of ICT's Flicker reagent for caspase-1 detection and explore our brand new pyroptosis caspase-1 assay. So when researchers think of cell death, apoptosis is often the first method that comes to mind. And this isn't surprising, as this was the first well-characterized program of cell death, and it is the most widely recognized. Apoptosis is a method of program cell death and is defined by caspase activity, which will be discussed more here shortly. Now, other methods include autophagy, an intracellular degradation system, and oncosis, which is a passive form of cell death due to lethal cell injury. Additionally, a more recently identified form of cell death included the highly inflammatory caspase-1-dependent form of cell death known as pyroptosis. Pyroptosis is triggered by infection, and infected cells will eventually swell, burst, and die. This, in turn, attracts other immune cells to fight the infection, leading to inflammation of the tissue and, in a functional response, rapid clearing of that infection. Now, unlike apoptosis, pyroptotic cell death results in plasma membrane rupture and subsequent release of intracellular contents, resulting in the inflammatory characteristic of this process. This is in contrast to apoptosis, where the cellular contents are packaged into apoptotic bodies that are ultimately taken up by phagocytic cells in a non-inflammatory manner. If we do look at the image shown on this slide, we can note the clear morphologic differences between the methods of cell death. On the apoptotic cell, we can see the intact membrane blebbing, and then compared to that ruptured membrane of the pyroptotic cell next to it. So just to continue to compare and contrast apoptosis and pyroptosis, we can see here in this table the list of morphological characteristics of the two methods of cell death. And again, as discussed on the previous slide, these two types of cell death uh, appear very differently uh, with the apoptotic cell blebbing and the pyropto pyroptotic cell swelling and lysing. So one common thread to both apoptotic and pyroptotic cell death is the activity of caspases. Caspases are the enzyme underlying the whole cell death process. Now caspases, or cysteine-dependent aspartate-directed proteases, are activated and then cleave substrates leading to the eventual disassembly of the cell. There are two different groups of caspases, those that are involved in apoptosis and those that are involved in inflammation. In terms of apoptosis, imitator caspases regulate apoptosis upstream by initiating caspase cascades, while effector caspases are responsible for proteolytic cleavages that lead to cell disassembly. Inflammation is heavily dependent on the activity of caspase-1, which is associated with inflammasome activity and is a key housekeeping enzyme in its conversion of pro-interleukin-1 beta protein into the active interleukin-1 beta cytokine. And again, that, that's going to be a thread that's repeated and touched on throughout today's presentation. Caspase-1 activity is integral to pyroptosis and is really the main focus of our webinar today. So, as discussed, the main player in pyroptotic cell death is this caspase-1 enzyme. And this caspase was first named interleukin-1-beta converting enzyme, as it's a protease that processes the inactive precursors of interleukin-1-beta and interleukin-18 into their active forms. Caspase-1 can activate these inflammatory cytokines but also trigger the plasma membrane rupture and other morphological characteristics of pyroptosis that we've discussed. So we'll talk about the specific mechanisms of caspase-1 shortly here in the presentation, but I wanted to first introduce its role among the several other key players here in the pyroptotic process. So now that we understand that caspase-1 is so important to the pyroptotic process, let's discuss how caspase-1 is activated in the first place. This brings us to two other key players, TLRs, 
or toll-like receptors, and NLRs, or knob-like receptors. The TLRs are transmembrane proteins that contain a leucine-rich repeat domain. They mediate host recognition of pathogens and danger-associated molecular patterns from extracellular signals and initiate a signaling cascade that begins production of inflammatory cytokines, like tumor necrosis factor, for example. The NLRs recognize danger signals intracellularly from the cell's cytosol and trigger a similar signaling cascade as the TLRs to start inflammatory cytokine production. NLRs also importantly function to trigger activation of caspase-1. Both TLR and NLR activities are very important uh, to, to a cell's response against a particular pathogen. Again, we're just introducing the key players here, and we'll go through more specifics of their mechanistic action shortly. So this then leads us to the inflammasome, which is a multi-protein complex that contains caspase-1 and is triggered by NLR activity. There are multiple inflammasome complexes that exist, of which the NLRP3 inflammasome is the most widely studied. Now, if you're more familiar with apoptosis, the inflammasome is analogous to the apoptosome, except instead of initiating apoptotic cascades, the inflammasome instead initiates inflammatory cascades. So now that we've assessed endpoint morphology and looked at some of the key players involved in the process, let's walk through a few diagrams and we'll go ahead and start to tie everything together. So first, sensing signals. Uh, let's take a look at the TLRs and NLRs in action. So we know that sensing both intracellular and extracellular danger signals leads to cellular activation and cell death. So to visualize the TLRs, uh, which are shown in yellow in this particular diagram, we can see that they detect the danger signals extracellularly and within endosomes. These TLRs initiate a signaling cascade involving nuclear factor kappa B, mitogen-activated protein kinase, and interferon regulatory factor-dependent pathways, which will then begin inflammatory cytokine production, uh, which includes interferon alpha and beta, tumor necrosis factor, interleukins 12, 6, and 8, as well as pro-interleukin 1 beta that will ultimately activate the cells. The NLRs are within the cytosol to detect danger signals. Uh, so nucleotide binding oligomerization domain containing protein 1, um, so NOD1 and NOD2 function similarly to TLRs, where they activate inflammatory cytokine production. However, other NLRs activate caspase 1 and trigger apoptosis or, excuse me, trigger pyroptosis in process and release inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-18. So once the signals are sensed, cascades are triggered, and caspase-1 is cleaved and activated, we'll take a look at how active caspase-1 functions in the context of pyroptosis, and it's ultimately um, the endpoint morphology. So active caspase-1 results in rapid formation of plasma membrane pores, which release cellular ions, allowing water influx. This causes cell swelling and lysis of the cell. Caspase-1 also processes and activates interleukin-1-beta and interleukin-18, which are then secreted from the cell. Uh, three proposed forms of secretion are shown in this particular diagram. Uh, the secretion through caspase-1 dependent pores, microvesicle shedding, and lysosome exocytosis. Now finally, caspase-1 activity can cause endonuclease-mediated DNA cleavage. And in contrast to apoptosis, the integrity of the nucleus is maintained during pyroptosis, as opposed to the nuclear fragmentation that you often find in the apoptosis process. 
So in this final slide here, we'll, we'll take a look at the cell as a whole, all of the actions happening together, and we'll tie everything together here. Uh, so again, oligomerization of the NLRP3 inflammasome is then triggered by two signals. And the first signal begins with the recognition of pathogen-associated molecular patterns by the TLRs, the toll-like receptors, uh, such as TLR4, for example, uh, which through interaction with the adapter protein MyD88 triggers activation of the transcription factor NFK-beta. And once activated, NFK-beta is then translocated to the nucleus, where it leads to the synthesis of the inactive pro-inflammatory cytokine pro-interleukin-1-beta. Another potent pro-inflammatory cytokine precursor, uh, pro-interleukin-18, is constitutively expressed uh, in this process. However, its expression is increased after cellular activation. The second signal is triggered by an ionic perturbation in the cell, such as an efflux of potassium ions caused by the ATP-dependent activation of the purinogenic P2X receptor which subsequently results in the assembly of the NLRP3 inflammasome, caspase-1 activation, and ultimately IL-1-beta and IL-18 secretion. So while pyroptosis does play, you know, an integral functional role in fighting infections through inflammation, chronic inflammation or other mutations within the pyroptotic pathway can lead to disease. So, for example, NLR protein mutations can often lead to incorrect caspase-1 activation uh, associated with different auto-inflammatory syndromes. Uh, expression levels of NLRP3 and thus downstream um, expression levels of caspase-1 have also been connected to type 2 diabetes, obesity, and insulin resistance. Uh, caspase-1 is also heavily involved in the pathology of many other diseases, such as the several listed here, uh, which are characterized by inflammation and cell death. As such, caspase-1 is a very attractive therapeutic target for many researchers, as its deficiency through inhibition could provide protection against inflammation, uh, which is, again, found in, in many different diseases. So this brings us now to ICT's FLICA kits, or fluorescent labeled inhibitor of caspases, um, which offer an in vitro whole cell detection method to study caspase activity in apoptotic or pyroptotic cells. Now these assays are available for a variety of different caspases, um, you know, in addition to the caspase one that we've been focusing on for today's presentation, um, as well as polycaspase activity as well if you just want to look at caspases in general. Uh, samples uh, for our FLICA kits can be analyzed using a flow cytometer, fluorescence plate reader, or fluorescence microscope. And in general, overall, for all of our different caspase assays, they are available in green, red, and far red options. So let's delve a little deeper into how specifically FLICA works. Now, the FMK group on the FLICA probe forms a covalent bind with the reactive catalytic sites on the active caspase enzyme. This enables the FLICA probes to be retained inside the cell despite the subsequent wash steps. FLICA is not cleaved by the caspase. Once the FMK reactive groups on the FLICA probes form covalent bonds with the two catalytic cysteine groups within each of the two caspase reactive sites, that particular caspase enzyme is rendered essentially inactive. It can no longer cleave any substrates. So to detect pyroptosis, ICT offers our brand new pyroptosis caspase-1 assay kit in green to detect caspase-1 activation in cell cultures using this popular FLICA technology. The kit is currently, uh, as I mentioned, just available in green fluorescence. Uh, we're looking at expanding that in the future. Um, but currently, the green fluorescence can be analyzed using the fluorescence microscope, fluorescence plate reader, or flow cytometer. So to use FLICA, um, you can add it directly to your cell culture medium 
incubate, and wash. Flick is cell permeant and will efficiently diffuse in and out of all of your cells. If there's an active caspase-1 enzyme inside of the cell, it will covalently bind with the fam YVAD FMK probe and retain the green fluorescent signal within the cell. Unbound Flicka will diffuse out of the cell during the subsequent wash steps in the process. Therefore, positive cells will retain a higher concentration of Flicka and fluoresce brighter than the negative cells. There's no interference from procaspases or inactive forms of the enzymes. After labeling with Flicka, cells can be counterstained with other reagents or can be fixed or frozen. So I did want to talk about nigerisin as it's a reagent that we've specifically included uh, within the pyroptosis kit, or you can purchase it separately on its own uh, and use this as a positive control for your pyroptosis studies. Now this reagent is a potent microbial toxin derived from Streptomyces hygroscopicus. It acts as a potassium ionophore, inducing a net decrease in intracellular levels of potassium, which is crucial for oligomerization of the NLRP3 inflammasome and activation of caspase-1. Nigerisin requires signaling through panexin-1 to induce caspase-1 activation and interleukin-1 beta processing and release. It has been shown to generate a robust caspase-1 activation response in various cell lines, including JERCAT and THP1 cells. And as I briefly mentioned, uh, cells labeled with Flicka can be counterstained with reagents such as the red live dead stains, propidium iodide, and 7-AAD. Uh, nuclear morphology can also be concurrently observed uh, using HUXT, which is a blue DNA binding dye. So ICT's caspase-1 inhibitor reagent, uh, FAMYVAD-FMK, was used to monitor the caspase-1 induction response in JERCAT cells that were treated with nigerisin for various periods of time. A common cell pool was spiked with FAMYVAD-FMK and divided into separate treatment groups. Starting with 24-hour samples and working backwards, 10 micromolar nigerisin was added to cells and the samples were incubated at 37 degrees throughout the induction process. Following their respective treatment exposure periods, the cells were washed and analyzed on a flow cytometer. The amount of caspase-1 activity detected directly correlated to the duration of the exposure period. The longer the cells were exposed to nigerisin, the larger the proportion of caspase-1 positive cells found in the sample. So in this uh, example of plate reader data using this kit, uh, THP1 cells were plated in 12-well tissue culture plates and then treated with either a negative control, so the non-induced here, or PMA, which are pyroptotic and induced, to cause differentiation into the macrophages. After 48 hours, PMA-containing culture medium was removed, wells were rinsed to remove any non-adherent cells, and a fresh culture medium containing LPS was added to the induced sample wells. After a two-hour exposure period, LPS-containing medium was removed, cells were rinsed with PBS, and trypsinized to remove adherent cells. The trypsinized cells were transferred to tubes containing FBS to inactivate trypsin, and cells were gently pelleted by centrifugation. Supernatants were carefully removed, and samples were resuspended in PBS. Finally, samples were then stained with our FAM YVED FMK for one hour, and following the one-hour staining period, samples were washed three times and read on a fluorescence plate reader set at 48, uh, excuse me, 488 nanometers excitation and 530 nanometers emission using a 515 nanometer cutoff filter. And in the pyroptotic, which is the induced population, the relative fluorescence units of the green fluorescent signal was nearly two times greater than the relative fluorescence unit of the negative or non-induced population. So here, human colorectal adenocarcinoma cells were grown in polarized monolayers 
and were then infected with wild-type salmonella, which constitutively expressed M. cherry, so the red cells that you can see here. After nine hours, the live cells were incubated with ICT's active caspase-1 reagent, the FAMYVAD FMK, um, which you can see in the green cell, uh, for one hour in growth medium, washed, and then fixed. The confocal image here reveals an extruding cell that is infected, so many red M. cherry labeled salmonella are visible on that cell. And the infected cell is undergoing pyroptosis, as evidenced by the positive staining for active caspase 1 visible as increased green fluorescence compared to background levels of fluorescence in the surrounding caspase 1 negative cells. And we'll wrap up our data discussion here with uh, one other example of microscopy data. So in this figure, THP1 cells were treated with either a uh, negative control, the non-induced, or PMA to induce differentiation into the macrophages. After 48 hours, PMA was removed from the induced population and replaced with fresh medium containing LPS to induce the caspase-1 activation. Cells were stained with FAM, YVAD, FMK, washed, and examined with a microscope. And in the treated samples, uh, many cells appeared bright green, indicating the increased level of caspase-1 activity. In the non-induced sample, few of the green cells are visible, indicating a low level of caspase-1 activity. So to start wrapping up this presentation today, if you are looking for more examples of our cell viability assay kits in use or any other ICT products, we do have an extensive list of publications where our products are cited. As you can see from this publication map, we have thousands of publications from researchers all over the world. If you're looking for specific examples of our products in use, feel free to email me, and I would be happy to conduct a publication search for you to highlight uh, your product of interest. As you're planning out your project or working through an experiment, we do have a variety of resources available on our website to help you. You can find webinars such as this one on a wide variety of topics, so just go to our archive on our webinars page. We also have some short product demonstration videos if you'd like to see some of our popular kits in action. Uh, I do periodically update our blog with helpful tips, new citations, and company announcements, so check there for all your ICT news updates. And finally, we do have extensive documentation in the forms of product manuals, safety data sheets, and certificates of analysis that are really easily accessible from our product pages should you need them. And I did want to briefly mention that I will be in Washington, D.C. with ICT President Sally Head from April uh, 2nd through 5th. So if you're going to be at the AACR show, uh, make sure to stop by booth number 3144 to get some great giveaways, uh, receive an AACR-specific discount code, uh, and chat with us about your projects. Um, Conversely, if you are in the Washington, D.C. area and are not attending the conference but would just like to set up a meeting uh, while we're in town, uh, feel free to reach out and we can definitely set something up. So we do love this show, though, and we're really excited to talk to all sorts of cancer researchers about their work. So that concludes my presentation today, and I can now... Uh, take a couple more questions before signing off. Uh, if you have a question that necessitates a more in-depth technical response or a discussion of your project, I'll consult with our R&D staff and follow up with you personally shortly after the webinar. So feel free to keep chatting in your questions. If I don't get to yours, you know, you will get a response within the next couple days here. Um, so I guess to, to start, someone's asking more specifics about um, what the excitation and emission of the pyroptosis kit is and, you know, what technology they need for analysis. And so, um, you know, I'll say for this particular, you know, green fluorescence kit um, and any of our FAM FLICA, which are the, the green fluorescence FLICA kits, uh, these optimally excite at 488 to 492 nanometers. 
uh, and they do have a peak emission at 515 to 535 nanometers. And again, you do always have some flexibility here um, with how you analyze your data. You can go ahead and do this on a flow cytometer, fluorescence plate reader, or fluorescence microscope uh, as we walked through some of these data examples today. Um, someone else is asking um, about other types of cell death in addition to pyroptosis and, you know, whether ICT supports that type of work. Uh, so the answer is yes, and I would highly encourage you to uh, actually go watch the recording of our most recent, so our, our previous webinar, which is titled Solutions to Detect Cell Death, uh, Apoptosis, Pyroptosis, and Autophagy. And this talk given by our ICT scientist, Dr. Christy Strandberg, uh, gives a really nice overview of all of our cell death assays uh, from apoptosis to necrosis to cell viability studies. Uh, so again, that's just on our webinars archive on our webinars page. Um, okay, and yeah, I'll just, you know, take one last question here before wrapping up to keep us at half an hour, but um, someone wants to know about fixing their pyroptotic cells. And for our Flicka products, you can fix your cells after the fluorescent labeling is complete. So the fixative will not interfere with the FAM label. So if you can't evaluate your stained cell populations immediately, fixing is a good choice. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot go ahead and do staining on cells that are already fixed. So you do need live cells to start off the, these experiments. Um, great, so that, that's about all the time we have here today. Uh, thank you again so much for attending and for your excellent questions. If I was unable to get to your question, you know, I see a few here I, I wasn't able to get to. Um, I'll make sure to get you a response right after the webinar here. And again, I will be sending out the webinar recording within the next day or so. So if you think of any questions after the webinar or have ideas for future webinars, uh, please feel free to reach out, send me an email, or reach us through social media on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Uh, to give you a heads up, our next webinar is going to be held on April 29th. Uh, Dr. Brian Lee, who is a former ICT president and is now uh, one of our top technical consultants, will be discussing some inside tips and tricks for troubleshooting your ELISA development. So uh, you can go ahead and register on our webinars page for that talk. Um, that registration link will be up later today. So thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us, and have a wonderful day.